chapter 8. Uh, let me read a passage of Scripture that we're going to allow to be our spiritual food today. Uh, John chapter 8, starting in verse 30, says, As he was saying these things, the context, of course, is the woman caught in adultery and Jesus teaching on being the light of the world and uh, his predicting of some of what was going to come ahead. And uh, then it says in verse 30, As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We're the offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you'll become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Ugh. I've been doing a little informal survey this week. I've been going up to people. If I had seen you, I would have said it to you for sure. I would have said, um, are you saved? And you would have given me some kind of an answer. And then I would have been like, how do you know you're saved? And uh, so I don't mean to be critical or anything, but I have been really, really surprised at the answers that people have been giving me when I've been like, are you saved? And then after they say yes, then I say, how do you know? And you get these really kind of weak answers, honestly. And not biblical answers for sure. So I want to talk to you today about, without question, the most important subject in the universe to you. I, I want to talk to you about your salvation. All right? And I, I want to lead you through a little process of uh, honestly reflecting upon this thing that so many of you would say you have. And uh, my goal is not to make you think you don't have it if you do, but it's definitely to let you know that you don't have it if in fact you don't. This is something you can't afford to roll the dice on, right? I mean, you've got to have some real clarity on this subject. The Bible calls it your salvation. If a doctor were to do surgery on you and remove a terminal tumor, you would say that he had saved you. And if a fireman were to come into a burning building that was about to collapse around you, and he were to take you out of the building before it collapsed, you would say that he had saved you. And uh, if a lifeguard were to jump off their chair on the beach and go out into the ocean that was dragging you out to sea in an undertow and pull you back in before you went way out, uh, we would say that he or she saved you. All right? And, and the Bible teaches that you have a terminal tumor called sin. And it is such a strong undertow that it is dragging you out to sea. And that you are headed toward flames that never cease. But that God in His mercy sent His Son to die for your sin so that you could be saved. Now, fact is, is, is everybody's not saved. And there's a lot of people who say they're saved, but they're not saved. Okay? And there's a lot of people in our church who say that they're saved, but they're not saved. And, and you say, well, James, are you burdened about this? Let me just tell you that probably more than any other single thing, this keeps me up at night as it relates to our church. All right? Is, is that there are many people, the Bible uses the word many a lot in this regard, there are many people who think they are saved, but they are not. And as I prepared this message, i got to say, I honestly thought I should preach on this every year, one time at least, just this. Are you saved? Are you sure that you're saved? And do you have a biblical reason for saying that you're saved? Because you're not saved because you say so. And you're not saved because you know how to be saved. Any more than you're in Cincinnati because you know how to get there. Okay? It's not what you say. But how many people would agree in trying to answer this question, are you saved? How many people would agree that we're, that we're not wasting our time here today? All right? We, we are flat out not wasting our time. I want to be as clear as clear can be about this. So turn over in your Bible, please, uh, to Matthew chapter 13. This was a frequent uh, teaching uh, that came from the life of Christ. The difference between truth and error, light and darkness, wheat and tares. Start in with me at... Matthew 13, verse 18, please, where it says, Hear then the parable of the sower. He had just told the story, but he reviews it here. Verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom 
and that's the gospel, the good news that sins can be forgiven through faith in Christ. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Okay, so here's a guy who uh, hears the word, hears the gospel, he doesn't understand it, he's thinking about it, but he just doesn't really get it. And then Satan comes and snatches away the message, the word, the seed that was sown. It's taken away. Saved or unsaved? I'll just go with what you say. I'll just, interpretation by voting here. Saved or unsaved? Unsaved, without question. Unsaved. Heard the word, didn't get it, snatched away. Verse 20. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. I can go to heaven. I can go to heaven. I can go to heaven. I really want that. Well, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, underline immediately, immediately he falls away. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Yeah, well, following Christ is going to cost you something. I am so out of here right now. No one told me it was going to cost me anything. Saved or unsaved? Unsaved. Hung around for a while. Things got a little challenging. I will pay no price for this. Nothing. And gone. Not saved. Never saved. Didn't lose it. Never had it. Okay. Verse 22. As for what was sown among the thorns, the seed, the gospel, sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. Hmm, that's good. Hmm, that church is close to my house. Hmm, I kind of find that interesting. Hmm, I think I'll keep going back there. Until the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And it proves, some say it becomes, but the better translation by far is proves, it proves unfruitful. Unfruitful. So this is a person who has no fruit. They embrace the word in a superficial way, but they have hold up the universal symbol for how much fruit they have. They have no fruit. Saved or unsaved? Unsaved. Unsaved. Okay. Four professions. Here comes the fourth one. Only one of the four truly saved. I hope this is you, verse 23. As for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understand it, indeed bears fruit, and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. Some bear more fruit than others. All truly saved people bear fruit. Matthew 13, 24. Are you saved? Are you saved? Matthew 13, 24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. <laughs> but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. The servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them? He said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Many people believe in Jesus. That's the first main point. Many people believe in Jesus. Many people. And the truth of the matter is, is early on, you, you can't tell wheat, um, weed, you can't tell initially. You gotta wait till the plant's full grown. When does the fruit come on the plant? Early or late? When does the fruit come on the plant? Spring or fall? Fall, all right? So initially, many people believe in Jesus. They pray the prayer, they walk the aisle, they sign the card, they go through the baptistry, they do all the things that Christians do, but fact is, we don't know. Fact is, we don't know. Jot this down. Profession does not equal conversion. Many people believe in Jesus. In fact, James 2.19 says, You believe in God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. The demons are rattled by what they believe. But I think you'd all agree. Uh, demons, saved or unsaved? 
Okay, okay, so the demons believe and tremble, but they're not saved. And so belief does not equal automatically saved. It just doesn't. It's the quality, the caliber, the character of the belief that ultimately proves whether the person is genuinely converted. And so here in this passage, you got in one field, wheat and tares, saved and unsaved. And for a long period of time, the master's like, yeah, yeah you know what? Don't go out in the field and start ripping out the weeds or you're going to end up what? You're going to end up pulling up the wheat too because initially you can't tell the difference. You can't tell. You can't tell. Back to the text, Matthew 13. An enemy has done this, verse 28. Do you want us to go gather them? He said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Here it is. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned. Saved or unsaved, those weeds? Unsaved. But gather the wheat into my barn. All right. One more text to show you the same thing also in Matthew. One that we seem to refer to a little bit more frequently. Go over to Matthew 7. Again, let me just really encourage you not to invest the time of this message thinking to yourself, boy, I wish Bill was here to hear this. All right? And you can take Bill a tape, okay? This is for you right now. This is for you right now, right here. And by the way, I would just suggest to you that the more genuinely saved you are, the more delighted you are to review it, and, and the more marginal you are, the more aggravating this process is going to become. So that should help you. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, 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 Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who names my name will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said in a different passage of Scripture, Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord? You don't do the things I say. So, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father, underline that. It's it, the doing is the proving. The doing is the proving. The doing isn't the saving. The doing is the proving of the saving. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, what day? Well, the day when we all appear before the Lord. She's like, you can't believe how many people on that day are going to be like, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Prophesy means to speak for God. It's what I'm doing right now. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? How many people here have, don't, have cast out demons in Jesus' name? Some? Not many. What I'm trying to tell you is this, these are not the people down the street at the liberal church, okay? And uh, by the way, this isn't a message for another church. I only preach to one church. It's our church. But us right here. Because, because these are not marginal Christians. They're like, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did many mighty works in your name. Would you say that? Would you say, I have done many mighty works in God's name? Wow. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's not what you said. It's not what you did in serving me. Your life, your life was not characterized like a genuine follower of Christ. You just, you, you weren't a Christian. You, you worked like you were a Christian. You worshipped like you were a Christian. But you didn't live like one. You, you, you were a Christian at church, but, but that was it for you. It left with you as you exited the parking lot. I didn't know you. I never knew you. Depart from me. Not, not I used to know you and then I forgot you. God doesn't forget us, amen? Not I used to know you and I forgot you. I, keyword, never knew you. We never had a thing. You thought we had a thing, we had nothing. I never knew you. Depart from me, you are workers of lawlessness. Saved or unsaved? Unsaved. All right. Now, just to remind you how important this process we're going through right now is, the Apostle Paul said, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is as serious as serious gets. I guarantee you, a hundred years from today, this is the only thing that will matter to you. Not your bank book, not your job, not the economy, not the presidential election, not your burdens about your family. This is it. 
now. I'm on it. Your salvation. Because if many people who prophesied in His name and cast out demons in His name and did wonderful works in His name, if many people are going to hear that, you would be prideful to think that there won't be people from Harvest who will hear that. I, I didn't know you. If the Apostle Paul himself said, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. If Paul himself said, I fear that having preached to others, I myself would be disqualified. If Paul lived with the reality that at the end of the day, if his walk didn't match his talk, he didn't have it, no matter how many sinners' prayers he prayed. Okay. Paul said, at the end of the day, the proof's in the pudding. If my faith hasn't changed me, it hasn't saved me. Okay. Now back to John chapter 8. Let's bear up under what Jesus said to the true and false people in that passage. Many people believe in Jesus. So hopefully I've spent enough time on this now that you're asking yourself the question very appropriately, which you should be asking yourself, well, maybe I don't have it. If you're not asking yourself that question right now, I'm concerned for you. I ask myself the question very thoroughly this week. Do I really have it? Because many people believe in Jesus. Note this second thing. It's going to come out of John 8, 31. And we're going to go through this text verse by verse now. Genuine disciples abide in Jesus' words. That would be a phenomenal answer to the question. If I were to say to you, my brother, are you saved? I think you would say, yes, I am. All right. But then when I said to you, how do you know you are? If you're like, well, in Awana in 1974, I'd be like, Arr! wrong answer. Don't tell me how it happened. Give me evidence. Evidence number one, genuine disciples abide in Jesus' words. I asked this of my daughter-in-law today. I said, are you saved? She said, yes. I said, how do you know? And she said, because I have a growing hunger and desire for God's word. Great answer. Look at John 8, 31. Jesus said to the Jews, as he was saying these things, verse 30, many believed in him. So, he's like, oh, you're all in, huh? You're all in? Well, great. Verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. And so Jesus was seeing all these people raising their hands and walking to the front, and somebody was singing, just as I am. And they're all signing cards, and they're getting water in the baptistry and everything. And Jesus is like, oh, this is a wholesale response. Look at the hundreds of people coming here. He's like, yeah, you all believe in me, do you? Well, how about this? If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. In other words, time will tell. Maybe you're wheat, maybe you're tares, but time will tell. At the end of the day, the proof is going to be this. Do you abide in my word? The word abide means to remain or to continue. Are you remaining in God's word? Are you continuing in God's word? Salvation happens at a moment in time, but it's demonstrated over time.